America. My name is Dylan John, and you are listening to the Neofusionist Book Review. This is not your typical book review, as I make no claims to political or philosophical impartiality. This podcast uses the format of a book review to explore the premise of neofusionism. Neofusionism is the merging of paleoconservatism with naturalism within the framework of the revitalization of the Republican Party. We will be exploring politics, philosophy, psychology, economics, and sociology through a wide variety of books published both recently and historically. Thank you for tuning in. In this episode, we will be reviewing a book by Justin Raimondo called Reclaiming the American Right. This is a fantastic book that uh, provides some insight into what is referred to as the old right, and that's essentially the uh, the conservative Republican ideas prior to 1955, approximately. So you're talking about the early 20th century. He really starts his analysis, in, I believe, in the 1930s. There might be some mention of things that occur in the 20s, but it really begins in the 1930s. Uh, and follows up through the founding of National Review, which he really kind of lays as the as the end of the old right and the and the the rise of the new right. So we'll be looking at uh, at some of that. And he talks about a lot of people in this book. And I am more interested in ideas than individuals. Of course, these individuals have ideas, and that's really what he's talking about. But in reviewing this book, I want to focus on some of the ideas more so than the people that he talks about. So um, I will read a little bit of the introduction, and then I will read a section from the conclusion that uh, talks about some important ideas. So to begin with, uh, I'm going to go right ahead and read to you a little bit from the introduction um, when he lays out his thesis and provide a few brief comments. Uh, But primarily, I want to get a good chunk of the book, uh, of the sections that I intend to read, out there for you before we really begin to analyze it. Um, So anyway, let me get right into the beginning with the introduction. And I'm going to start right from the beginning here and read this section. He says, quote, after, oh, uh, by the way, this book was written in 1992, I believe it came out, 92 or possibly 93. I'm not sure because what I have is a, um, a reprint of the book from 2008. Uh, and in this book, 15, uh, 16 years after it was originally uh, released, there are some essays in the back that add some commentary to, uh, to the original text. Um, but keep in mind that what I'm reading to you primarily, un- until I get to the commentary, what I'm reading to you is was originally written in 1992. So uh, keep that context in mind as I read this. So he says, quote, After a decade in power, why has the conservative movement failed to make a dent in the growth of big government? After taking over the Republican Party in the 60s and then capturing the White House in 1980, conservatives are baffled to discover that the power of the federal government to tax, regulate, and invade every aspect of our lives has not lessened but increased over the last decade. Bewildered, frustrated, and demoralized, the men and women of the right are asking themselves, what went wrong? This haunting question cannot be answered unless conservatives are willing to confront the ghosts of their intellectual ancestors. Before they can understand what is happening to their movement in the 90s, conservatives must re-examine their past and learn the secret of their true history. The purpose of this book is to uncover it. But before we start digging, it is necessary to examine the current crisis on the right an identity crisis that began with the spectacular breakup of the Soviet Empire. Before the Great Revolution of 1989-91, to which overthrew communism in Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, the right marched in virtual lockstep, united on the top priority of a global crusade against Marxism-Leninism. Today, the conservative movement is united on nothing. Not even the traditional conservative credo of limited government. The 90s have seen the growing dominance of a new faction on the right, the neoconservatives. Fred Barnes of the Weekly Standard has aptly dubbed them the big government conservatives. Instead of railing against the corruption of the Republic and the depredations of the New Deal and the Great Society, they are comfortable with the legacy of FDR and seek not to repeal it but only to trim it around the edges. 
big government conservatives don't want to roll back or, God forbid, abolish the welfare state, but only to modify it, modernize it, and make it more efficient. In this view, the American state is much like its European cousins. It is provider, as well as protector and policeman, not only of its own mean streets, but of the entire world. This is the opposite of the view taken by the old right. That coalition of libertarian and conservative writers, publicists, and politicians who united against the Roosevelt Revolution, opposed U.S. entry into World War II, and decried the permanent war economy. For reasons that today's neoconservative intellectuals dismiss as nativist, the old right used to argue in terms of an American exceptionalism, a largely unspoken but all-persuasive assumption that the new world is and ought to be exempt from the vicissitudes ordinarily visited upon the old. This American exceptionalism animated the right's case for limiting the power of the state, both at home and abroad, right up until the U.S. entered World War II. Based on the bedrock American political values of individualism, anti-statism, and the kind of foreign policy envisioned by Washington in his farewell address, the laissez-faire credo of the old right was founded on this reverence for a revolution exemplary. Even as late as the mid-50s, the idea of a conservative globalism seemed unthinkable, for this would cut out the very heart of the American conservative soul, the nationalism that was unlike any other. Unique in that it was founded neither in ancient folk dances, nor religion, nor ethnicity, but in an abstract and revolutionary idea inextricably bound up with the American character, the idea of liberty. End quote. Okay, so uh, then he goes on for a brief section here to describe uh, the successive waves of, of infiltration uh, into the conservative movement by defectors from the left, starting with the founding of National Review and what he calls the New Right in 1955. Um, the National Review, many of the of the participants and editors of the National Review in its early days, including Frank Meyer, who we previously spoke about, uh, had come from communism or, or from the left, primarily former communists, former Trotskyites that had defected from their previous ideology and moved to the right to establish a, a sort of messianic holy war against communism. Uh, these were virulent anti-communists who had, who had been thoroughly disillusioned with what they had experienced in communism and, and moved to the right. But their, um, their origins in communism always affected their view. Uh, and that's understandable. If they had come of age and come up in the communist mindset, um, it's inevitable that their outlook would be colored by that. And they became... Uh, advocates of this sort of global ideology. Uh, it was a global ideology that was counter to communism, but nonetheless, it was a global ideology because they had been reared in a circumstance that was rooted in global ideologies. Uh, so there's much of that communist mindset that winds up infiltrating conservatism as a result of all this influx of former communists. So he talks about the rise of the new right in the 1950s, and then he talks about the rise of the neoconservatives in the 60s and 70s. And then he goes on uh, to talk about, uh, quote, he says, while the conservative mainstream was content to meander along in the old way, the neocons were incubating the third generation of their little band in the think tanks, magazines, and activist organizations of the right. This third wave seeks to finally replace what they regard as the nativist mythology of American exceptionalism with a new conservatism, one that is mildly statist, falsely democratic, and aggressively globalist, with emphasis on this last. The battle cry of these ideologues is global democracy. Some, like Francis Fukuyama, proclaim the end of history and the inevitable triumph of Western liberalism. Others, like Joshua Moravchik, want to help the end of this history along a bit and urge the U.S. government to launch a campaign to export democracy. Thus, the seeds of a new universalism, a new totalism, are even now growing in the ashes of the old, sprouting in the core institutions of the conservative movement. The co-optation and corruption of the right means that the American political dialogue is now 
decisively tilted in favor of statism. For if conservatives are committed to a globalism that sets no limits on the exercise of power, either at home or abroad, then the dialogue becomes a monologue. In that case, the American character cannot save the republic. Nothing can. Yet there are hopeful signs. When the Berlin Wall fell, it sent a seismic shock clear across the Atlantic, from one end of the American political spectrum to the other, Old assumptions were shaken and old orthodoxies crumbled. Certainly the death of communism has had a devastating effect on the left, on the domestic scene as well as abroad. Except for American academics and the Soyuz group in the Russian parliament, no one is a Marxist-Leninist anymore. Yet it isn't only, or even chiefly, on the left that the collapse of communism has wreaked devastation. The right is today embroiled in an inter internecine struggle, every bit as vicious as the ancient blood feuds coming to the surface in the post-communist Balkans. The Cold War consensus, which once cemented the various conservative constituencies into a united front against communism, is finished, and all of the old divisions and antagonisms have suddenly reasserted themselves. The American right has been shaken to its very foundations, and conservatives are split into rival factions based on polar opposite reactions to the sudden absence of an overwhelming external threat. The challenge to the neocons comes from rebels who call themselves paleoconservatives. The prefix paleo is derived from the Greek word palaio, which means ancient. As Llewellyn H. Rockwell Jr., president of the Ludwig von Mises Institute, a leader in this new movement, put it, the rebel paleocons are, quote, cultural traditionalists who reject the egalitarian movements that have wielded their way through America. They share the Founding Fathers' distrust of standing armies, look to the original American foreign policy of isolationism as a guide to the post-Cold War era, and see the welfare state as a moral and constitutional monstrosity." End quote. The paleoconservative response to the Kremlin's downfall, like that of most Americans, was a sense of overwhelming relief. They genuinely looked forward to post-communist quiescence, and when George Bush rallied the country to the cause of the New World Order and against the alleged threat posed by Saddam Hussein, they dissented, and not so politely. The neoconservatives have responded to the death agony of communism quite differently. They are thrilled by the sight of their old enemies, the Stalinists, tossed on the dustbin of history, and at the same time, the direct sight of it makes them distinctly uneasy. Unlike their paleo-distant cousins, they saluted when Bush raised the banner of the New World Order. They jumped at the chance of embarking on an open-ended quest to make the world orderly, safe, and even democratic. Indeed, they were more royalist than the king before, during, and after the war against Iraq, urging Bush to strike as soon as Saddam invaded Kuwait and lamenting the fact that Storm and Norman did not march all the way to Baghdad. They feel the lack of some overwhelming danger some Satan with a sword, and look for new enemies, new crusades, new reasons to pour billions and blood into building an American empire on which the sun never sets. He goes on to say, quote, The history of the modern conservative movement in America is really the history of two movements. The old right, the original right, was nationalist, populist, and fundamentally libertarian. The Cold War right, dominated in large part by ex-leftist converts to conservatism, was militantly internationalist, increasingly elitist, and largely indifferent to free market economics, indifferent indeed to virtually everything but the crusade against communism. Starting out at opposite ends of the political spectrum, these two movements eventually came to meet and merge. The end result of this long process, which began in the mid-50s and was completed by the time the 80s rolled around, was the transformation and betrayal of the American right. End quote. All right, so that is the that is a good portion of the introduction. He lays out his thesis that uh, from the mid-50s through uh, the 80s and even into, um, well, when he's writing in 92, there continues this, this um, infiltration into the right of people who, whose ideas originated on the left, the dilution of... Uh, right-wing ideas, the, the removal of nationalism 
isolationism, non-interventionism uh, from the conservative movement. Now, I want to mention here that uh, Raimondo essentially views the old right as very much synonymous with libertarianism. The individuals that he chooses to talk about and the, the ideas that he chooses to focus on are largely uh, libertarian ideas. Um, he focuses extensively on the old right focus on non-intervention and free market economics, opposition to the New Deal, and opposition, in large part, opposition to the Cold War. And the people that he talks about um, carry these ideas, and he talks a lot about, the, he talk, has a section about the libertarian movement. He talks about Murray Rothbard, who is a famous libertarian, as being really uh, a chief voice of carrying the, uh, the old right ideas into the mid and later uh, 20th century. Um, and he talks about Rothbard's association with the left in seeking out allies to advance a non-interventionist policy. And he criticizes Meyer, Frank Meyer, uh, who we talked about last episode. He criticizes Meyer for essentially attacking Rothbard uh, for being such a strict libertarian. Now, Meyer was the advocate of fusionism, and so Meyer's position was essentially that conservatism requires acknowledgement of libertarian and traditionalist ideas. And Rothbard, being such a libertarian and really not much of a traditionalist at all, um, that, that Rothbard was not a part of that conservative camp. Um, and that's understandable, I believe, from Meyer's position, it, you know, given what he was trying to do in forming um, a basis for the conservative coalition. So I think it's understandable what Meyer did, but uh, Raimondo in this book kind of uh, kind of chastises Meyer as being a member of the New Right in how he attacks Rothbard. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, one other thing that I thought was really interesting is that the idea of New Fusionism comes up several times in this book. Now. When I originally created this podcast, I kind of, you know, came up with the idea of neo-fusionism, a, a re-envisioning of fusionism for the modern era. Uh, but I figured I can't be the only person who has ever dreamed up this concept. So, you know, a little bit of internet research, and I found that, yes, there are other people who have talked a little bit about a new fusionism, although they don't use the phrase neo-fusionism. Um, the phrase new fusionism has been used before. It hasn't really taken hold and hasn't really got a movement or force behind it, but the idea has come up. And so the, the phrase new fusionism comes up in this book, which I thought, well, that's great. That gives me an opportunity to talk about it a little bit and to acknowledge that I'm not the only person who has dreamed this up. Uh, so I'm going to read a brief section here within the chapter called uh, The Paleoconservative Revolt. Now, in this chapter, I'm not going to talk an awful lot about this chapter because, again, Raimondo focuses on people. And so in this chapter, he really focuses on Pat Buchanan. Uh, I covered a book by Pat Buchanan uh, previously in the podcast. Uh, I hope to cover more books by Buchanan. I think he's a great spokesman for the paleoconservative movement. Uh, but I don't want to get into his analysis of Buchanan because it's partly biographical and uh, I'm, as I said, I'm much more interested in the in the ideas Raimondo is putting forward versus his analysis of, of other individuals. So I'm just going to read a brief section from this chapter, very brief, when he first brings up the phrase new fusionism. And what he's talking about is Chronicles Magazine and its editor, Tom Fleming. Chronicles Magazine is sort of the, uh, well, at least in 1992, it was sort of the flagship magazine of paleoconservative thought. And, uh, and Tom Fleming is a paleoconservative thinker uh, as editor of this magazine from that time. So he says, um, he says, quote, Fleming calls for a new fusionism, which combines a love of liberty with the old right insight that, as Garrett Garrett put it, the revolution was. Or as Fleming says, quote, it is too late to think about conserving. There is not much left of the old republic, which has been bloated into a swollen and cancerous empire that threatens to devour all the life and energy that still exists. We don't need to reform the nation. We need to take it back from the occupying army 
of government officials and managers and interest groups that treat the citizenry like a conquered people, end quote. So, um, so Fleming doesn't, in this section, Fleming, who Raimondo is quoting, doesn't really explain an awful lot about what he means by new fusionism, aside from essentially, he says, combines a love of liberty, okay, well, there's the libertarian half, with the old right insight that the revolution was. In other words, an insight that is less cons about conserving anything and more reactionary, more about a radical return to a previous state of affairs. So more reactionary than conservative. He doesn't use the word traditionalist, and he doesn't really explain it in that manner. He merely is kind of a, a combination of libertarianism with the reactionary thought. Um, so that's a little bit different than what I'm trying to present. Although I do want to incorporate reactionary thought, I think that reactionary thought and traditionalism go hand in hand. Uh, but if you want to look at reactionary uh, thought and traditionalism as being close cousins, um, then ultimately the, the, the new fusionism that Fleming is talking about is really not that different from the original idea of fusionism in combining libertarianism with traditionalism. Uh, so it's really in a reinvigoration of the original fusionist ideas, whereas uh, what I'm trying to talk about is reinvigorating those fusionist ideas but adding something uniquely different in adding in naturalism, which I'm not really going to talk about in this episode, and I haven't talked about extensively, but I certainly am going to get more into that uh, as we go. For these early podcasts, I really just want to lay down the foundation for paleoconservatism. Um, and as, as we go, I'm going to get into more of the naturalist perspective. Uh, but I just thought it was interesting that he brings up the idea of new fusionism. And then uh, I'm going to jump to the last chapter called Taking Back America when he brings up the idea of new fusionism again. And, uh, and he says, quote, The paleo revolt is not to be stopped. Before the revolt can become a revolution, however, paleo conservatives must forge a program and devise a strategy. Before they can begin the fight to roll back a big government, authentic conservatives must unite behind a campaign to take back America, to take it back from the empire builders and international do-gooders and their foreign lobbyist allies who milk the American taxpayer for billions in foreign aid each year, to take it back from the career victims who have used the power of the state to entrench and expand their special privileges, to take it back from the bureaucrats, the special interests, and the politicians who are feeding at the public trough and draining the country dry, to take it back from the corporate professional, and managerial elites who have seized the reins of power in the culture as well as in the government and who threaten what remains of the old republic. Counterpoised to the British model of a do-gooding, tax-eating bureaucracy at home and a do-gooding, foreign aid-devouring overseas empire, paleoconservatives hold up the distinctly American model of limited government at home and strictly limited foreign entanglements, limited, that is, to trade agreements. This was once the majority sentiment in America, and it can be again, but it will not happen without a battle and a self-righteous paleoconservative movement that honors its old right heritage, knows its enemies, and has not forgotten how to fight. And then he goes on to say, quote, The collapse of communism liberated not only the peoples of Eastern Europe and the Soviet Union, but also American conservatives. The Cold War froze the conservative movement locked it in a rigid posture, and effectively ended all debate on the right. Today, it is no longer an act of thought crime for conservatives to advocate a policy of non-intervention, nor is it a hate crime to utter the formerly forbidden words, America first. It is a great advance, yet we have far to go. As Garrett said, we need leadership. But this presupposes an organized movement, which assumes a common program and a set of fundamental principles. This is the task of the new fusionism, to hammer out a common platform and a strategy to win. Before the dialogue can even begin, it is, first of all, necessary to give such a movement a sense of history, a sense of its roots and its place in the world. That is what I have tried to do in this book. Having established this common history and regained a sense of intellectual community, 
the new fusionists can then begin to build a movement to take back their party and their country. To be sure, there are divisions over trade policy, legislating morality, and questions of strategy and tactics. No doubt these will be discussed openly and vigorously. To reconcile liberty and tradition, to balance American nationalism against the requirements of a free market and a free society, to present a radical and positive alternative to the right-wing social democrats who have taken over the conservative movement and hijacked the Republican Party, these tasks will not be accomplished overnight. But more than half the battle is already won. Paleoconservatives and old right libertarians certainly know what they are up against. Big government, confiscatory taxation, foreign aid, the new world order. More importantly, we have a general idea of what we are for. Free markets, tax rollbacks, and a non-interventionist foreign policy that puts America first. There is some preliminary general agreement on the subject of strategy and tactics. By its very nature, the paleoconservative revolt embodies a resurgent populism, a grassroots rebellion against an arrogant managerial elite. All right, end quote. So there again, he brings up the idea of new fusionists uh, and ties that very closely with paleoconservatives, um, which I think is wonderful. Um, and I just fe feel like I should kind of mention, I mentioned before that he, that he really takes a libertarian approach. He really views the old right as more libertarian. There are other thinkers out there. Uh, Paul Gottfried wrote an article um, that talks about new fusionism. I can't remember the name of it offhand, but um, if you search online for Paul Gottfried, new fusionism, I'm sure you'll find it. And he talks about the old right, and he really lays out the old right as traditionalists. And he associates it with Richard Weaver, and he associates it with Russell Kirk uh, as being like the, the old right, and then talks about how the old right interacts with the libertarians, interestingly, placing the old right in the traditionalist camp more than the libertarian camp. So there are different perspectives on this. I think that the smart approach is to say that the old right encompasses both libertarians and traditionalists and the fusionists that brought them together. Um, and although the, the fusionists brought them together under the mantle of anti-communism with the fall of global communism, uh, we can reclaim the old right mentality with a return to the fusionist idea and an embrace of libertarians and traditionalists. So now uh, there's a few essays at the end of the book because this, again, was uh, is a, a reprint of the book that came out quite a few years later, uh, I guess about 15 years after the original publication, where there are a few essays from people that are speaking about uh, his book. So... I'm going to read a bit from one where the phrase new fusionism comes up again. And so uh, this is by Scott Richard. The title is The Old Right and the Traditionalist Antipathy to Ideology. Now, Richard makes the case that traditionalism is a much more important component to uh, the old right than Raimondo acknowledges, which is sort of you know what I was just saying. Uh, but Richard may, has an interesting section at the end of his essay where he talks about new fusionism, interestingly enough, and so I want to read this. He says, quote, What is needed, Raimondo declares, is what Thomas Fleming in the May 1991 issue of Chronicles called a new fusionism between the libertarian heirs of the old right and the paleoconservative heirs of traditionalism. But while Raimondo, in his final chapter, outlines the goals of such an effort, a strategy for victory remains elusive. If the battle is fought on the playing field of national ideological politics, where the partisans of liberty have been consistently defeated for 60 years, there is little reason to believe that the new fusionist coalition will be successful. And many reasons, 15 years and four presidential elections after the initial publication of Reclaiming the American Right, to believe it will not be. For such a grassroots movement to succeed, its members must forsake the politics of ideology, stressing, as Raimondo does, the common history of the new fusionists, but recognizing that that history forms a tradition in itself, 
Rather than attempting to reconcile liberty and tradition, we need to recover the traditional roots of liberty and recognize that liberty without tradition cannot long survive because it leads to atomization and the destruction of those institutions and attachments which alone can act as brakes on the power of the central state. We need to acknowledge, in other words, that there is something worthwhile in religion, ethnicity, even ancient folk dances. There is a reason why the totalist state, which is so destructive of human liberty, hates all of those things too. In reclaiming the American right, Justin Raimondo delivers a clarion call in defense of the American history of liberty. Fifteen years after his book was published, it is more than time for his conservative counterparts to respond in kind with a robust defense of the traditional institutions of Western civilization. Those traditions alone made possible the liberty that we once enjoyed, and Deo Valente may someday enjoy again. End quote. So yeah, he's, he's really um, kind of calling for uh, a response of the paleoconservative traditionalist um, wing of the Republican Party to engage with the uh, old right libertarian wing of the Republican Party in, in combining these forces together, the paleos and libertarians, in building a new fusionism. Um, so those were the sections that I wanted to read. And, you know, I, I think it's really interesting how how they talk about a new fusionism, but frankly, I don't think that simply harking back to the fusionism of the past is going to be effective. Um, we have to, I believe, we have to have some new language, some, some new approach uh, that can really like spark a fire and catch people's attention. Now, it's my belief that um, the left has kind of laid claim to the idea of science and w having laid claim to it no longer gives it much attention. Essentially, the only area where the left talks about science is in its defense of um, climate change um, science. You know, and the, the idea that climate change is real and it's man-made and et cetera, et cetera. And, and because the Democratic Party tends to be the, the party that recognizes this, it therefore is the party of science. And, you know, you get that all the time. There's a real consensus on the left among the Democrats that they are the party of science. And this has not been ground that has been fought for. This is ground that has been conceded by the right. Because the right has... Laid itself as the as the side that the that adheres to religious orthodoxy, and that paints the left as godless, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and, and claims to be the the religious home in the political spectrum. But in reality, if you explore uh, social science, psychology, human nature things like that, you you start to discover an interesting fact that, that the left has abandoned the notion of social science. The, ne the, the neo-fusionist approach, the new fusionism, can have a tremendous impact if it aggressively claims the mantle of science. Because evolutionary psychology and the scientific study of human nature provides a tremendous amount of support for conservative ideas, for paleoconservative ideas and libertarian ideas that once, once the, those, once social science started to unveil these, these things that ran counter to the leftist ideology, the left gave up on social science. It completely gave up, especially with the with the release of the book Sociobiology that, that supported some right-wing ideas. The left just gave up on it and moved into the realm of Marxist theory. Not it moved into, but like kind of diverted itself toward Marxist theory, feminist theory, critical race theory. It's all these theories. It's not science. It's not actual empirical fact. 
It's just proposals of how society works because the science doesn't support their perspectives. And we're beginning to see the rise of this intellectual dark web, this, this, this promotion that, that actual science, unconstrained by leftist ideology, creates the creates a totally new a totally new understanding of how human societies work and i think that's the that's the spark that's going to bring the new the new fusionism away from just a repetition of the ideas of of uh the 40s 30s 40s and 50s into the 21st century and can spark new conversations i don't think we can just rehash the ideas of the past i understand that the fall of communism has kind of eliminated the uh, Cold War. Should have elimin- should have provided a, an opportunity to eliminate the Cold War ideology from the conservative movement. Should have eliminated the 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 massive focus on militarism that you have seen in the, in conservatism and in the Republican Party, and that hasn't happened. And you know we can make the case that it should happen. And I wholeheartedly support non-interventionism and a military drawdown from the world. But where, you know, where is that happening? It's not happening. I don't know if, I mean, I love to see like with the, with the rise of Donald Trump, that there is a paleo conservative revival. A lot of Donald Trump's campaign touched on paleo conservative themes. Uh, the the intense focus on immigration, which this book doesn't talk about at all, but um, the the focus on immigration is a is a core component of Pat Buchanan's vision of paleoconservatism. And Pat Buchanan, as the book mentions, is kind of the figurehead of paleoconservatism. He focuses very much on reduction in immigration, which falls back to this core tenet of paleoconservatism, which is um, a defensive posture, a nationalist defensive posture. We are protecting our borders. We are um, protecting our economy. We are having a non-interventionist, protective, defensive military stance rather than an offensive, globalist, interventionist military stance. Um, And that's a core element of paleoconservatism. And I like to think that with the rise of Donald Trump, those ideas are more entering the mainstream. And I hope that 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 continues. Um, But I think that it can be strengthened with with a scientific backing as to as to how those policies conform to human nature. And I'm going down on a on a bit of a tangent here, but I just uh, I'm really interested in how he talks about neo-fusionism and you don't hear this really ever. It came up in the book, it comes up here and there, but you don't hear it ever because it lacks it lacks that spark. It lacks that idea of something new. But I do think that it's critical for people who are interested in the Republican Party, who are interested in paleoconservative ideas, to dig back into their history and realize that the Republican Party and the conservative movement has not always looked the way it looks right now. We need to understand this. We need to understand that in the 40s and in the 30s, the Republican Party was very different than it is today. Um, not completely different. I don't really ascribe to the whole switcheroo theory that the, what used to be the Republicans are now the Democrats, and what used to be the Democrats are now the Republicans, and the parties did this switch like it's a like it's a political square dance or something, and each took each other's position. I just you know I find that a little hard to believe, but nonetheless, parties change, posi- positions and platforms change, and liberty and um, nationalism were more prominent in the older Republican Party. And so it, it's imperative for, for people today to make the case that what they are advancing is the is the traditional origins of the 20th century Republican Party. Um, to familiarize themselves with people like you know, Garrett Garrett, who I mentioned a little bit in reading some of those quotes, he talks about him quite a bit. Garrett Garrett, John Flynn, uh, Colonel McCormick, Ayn Rand, um, Frank Chodorov, and Rose Wilder Lane, and the other people that he talks about in this book who have, nobody knows who these people are. Senator Taft, no, Mr. Republican. People don't even know who these people are. 
But these are the people that were the thinkers of the old right. These are the people who were driving the ideas uh, or who were at least making the strongest case for these ideas that used to be the default. It used to be, in, in many ways, the default position not only of Republicans but of Amer the American people in the first half of the 20th century. I mean, I think that studying the politics of the first half of the 20th century is critical because we can't just approach politics and say that the conservative movement was born with National Review. Mo the modern conservative movement, okay, the modern conservative movement was born with National Review, but what was before that? Uh, it was maybe not, maybe they didn't necessarily call themselves conservatives, but the roots of the modern conservative movement reach back into the individualists, like like um, Albert Nock, uh, Mencken, the individualists of the first half of the 20th century, the libertarians like Hayek and Mises of the first half of the 20th century. You know, so one of the things that I want to do, and this, you know, this will also come down to my study of Heidegger, is to look into the thinkers from, uh, primarily, say, from the presidency of McKinley, um, you know, he was elected in 1896, and he was a, a, a strong protectionist. And what the Republican Party looked like at that point in time, which was like, I mean, the, the early days of the Republican Party from, from its formation in the mid-19th century up through the mid-20th century, that like, like those hundred, almost 100 years of the Republican Party prior to the foundation of National Review, that is almost a century of Republican ideas that has been left in the dustbin. And we should be going back, you know, looking at like Calvin Coolidge, the presidency of Calvin Coolidge. He was a fantastic president. So all of these thinkers from before the 50s, before the Cold War, what did these guys think? What did the individualists think? Because the individualists were largely um, non-interventionists. And, you know, now the Republican Party has become this globalist interventionist party that believes in having military bases across the world. It's essentially a drive toward empire that is advanced by people in the party that once was vehemently opposed to it, like in the, in the days of the America First Committee uh, in, in the 30s and early 40s. I guess it, it dissolved in 41, but, but primarily in like the late 30s, the America First Committee was conservative, Republican, non-interventionist, nationalist party. And, you know, Donald Trump's America First uh, motto echoes that. Let's understand it. Let's dig back into the past, open that up and say, you know, why can't we go back to America First in our foreign policy? Why can't we take a primarily defensive posture? Maybe that wasn't as feasible during the Cold War. Maybe at that time we needed to be a little bit more involved in the world to create a global bulwark against the spread of aggressive communism. Those days are gone and it's time to draw back. It's time to say America First once again. So. Um, with that said, I think that this book provides a great intellectual foundation uh, for understanding the old right, understanding the roots of the libertarian movement and the roots of the paleoconservative movement and how um, you know, neo-fusionism or new fusionism can be a critical component of, of going back to that, to that idea. And I just want to lay out one last thing is that you know, my vision for neo-fusionism is obviously has a naturalist component. That's my personal vision for what a successful recipe is going to look like. I know that there are many people out there that are not naturalists, that believe in a supernatural uh, foundation for human value and human morals, etc., and, and a supernatural foundation for the nature of mankind. That's fine. Everybody's entitled to their opinion. And I think that those those people can have um, a strong impact on steering conservatism in a better, more paleoconservative direction. Um, I don't think that my vision of neo-fusionism necessarily needs to be the only vision. As I said in a previous podcast, there, ha there, there has to be or there should be uh, 
a variety of opinions on both sides of the aisle. We can't just have one opinion on the left and one opinion on the right. But if the right can, frankly, fracture itself in a positive way, it doesn't need to be balkanized and constant infighting, but kind of a big tent approach where we can have different groups of right-wing thinkers with different impressions of how the right wing and how the Republican Party should think, that can be nothing but positive. So I'm not saying that everybody needs to buy into my personal vision of, of neo-fusionism, but I just want to lay it out there and say that it's it's possible to, to think like I do. It's legitimate. And um, if it's appealing to you, then now you have a name for it. And I'm, I'm excited to explore those ideas. So um, I've rambled on for quite a while. I'm going to bring this to a close. I think that if you are listening and you think that neo-fusionism is, is a worthwhile area of exploration and the history of uh, paleoconservatism, the history of the Republican Party is a worthwhile thing to explore, talk about and study and apply to the modern world, then please, I urge you to check out my Patreon page and become a supporter of this podcast. It will enable me to um, sponsor um, advertising, sponsor Facebook posts on Facebook uh, and, and other ways of reaching more people, getting my hands on the materials that I need to make the podcast uh, top quality, uh, get my hands on some of the new books that are coming out. I've been covering a lot of older books um, this is one of the newer books I've covered. A lot of stuff that I've that I've covered has been written in the first in, in the mid mid twentieth century or even early twentieth century. Heidegger is written in the twenties. Um, the in defense of uh, tradition that's from largely from the fifties and sixties. I want to get some of the stuff that's coming out recently. There's a lot of good stuff that's coming out recently. So I urge you to check out my Patreon page. Throw me some support and I'll be able to get my hands on some more interesting stuff that I can review and spread the message. Um, so there's my plug for that. Uh, check out the Facebook page where I'll be posting some more links to things that relate to this. Um, and I guess that's about it. Uh, I thank you very much for tuning in, and I hope to uh, see you again next episode. Bye.